look out because we've got a hot one for you today. In this episode, we take you to the outer limits of the powder coating universe when we discuss the hidden secrets to hot flocking. We'll rocket to the inner atmosphere of this highly taboo subject and moonwalk through troubleshooting to conquer some bad examples of what can happen when things go wrong. When we reach our destination, we'll arrive on the planet we call Zen. Join us with our very own Major Tom, our in-house powder coater, Ross Scott, as he returns to Earth to share some great tips from the Magic Zone. Welcome to another edition of the Ross Coat Powder Coater Podcast. We interview influencers in the industry and cover trending topics to uh, powder coaters so they can effectively learn and grow their business. Today's episode is episode number three, Hidden Secrets to a to Proper Hot Flocking. Today, my husband, Ross, is back and giving us his take on hot flocking. We also call it hot coating uh, here in Hawaii. Um, and we're also hopefully going to tease out with him what uh, he calls creating that magic zone when attempting to do this process. But first, we still are having a launch party over here. We're so excited with all the feedback and comments that we've been getting on Reddit. Uh, the podcast page and um, the Facebook groups. Uh, shout out to Chris Small and Jimmy O'Malley. Um, they basically are first time listeners to even listening to a podcast. And also um, they are, it's, they said that uh, Chris said that it was refreshing to hear somebody that didn't learn a course uh, as he doesn't have any in his country. So uh, thanks, Chris, for that comment. Um, and also we have NGM Coatings posted. Thank you for doing this uh, for us new and upcoming coders. I look forward to listening to all the new podcasts or episodes. Uh, thank you and you're welcome. We're excited to be getting that feedback from you. Let's us know that we're talking about things you want to hear about. Also, one last shout out to Steve Schilling on the Powder Coder Business Group on Facebook. Uh, yes, we are now on iHeartRadio. Um, I just uploaded that. So if you don't see us uh, today or tomorrow, just give us give it a few days and it'll, it'll be up there. Um, also, for those of you that to, are tuning in regularly, we are now on Apple iTunes. Spotify, SoundCloud, and I believe Google Play. So please like, share, and subscribe to our website, uh, https forward slash forward slash www.crosscoat.com. And just a quick review of the episode uh, one and two. Of course, our first episode was just going um, and introducing ourselves as the husband and wife team, Ross Coat. Uh, we're you can learn about why we started the podcast and we talk a little bit about our story. And of course, episode two, which just got released earlier um, uh, this week, uh, was an interview with Ronan from Roro Designs 2, who has inspired us all to create a better customer experience. Now, on to today's guest. Uh, Ross, are you there? Hi, welcome. Hi. So um, now let's get into this taboo and somewhat controversial subject in powder coating that's discussed in a lot of forums and groups. Um, can you tell us just in simple words, what is hot flocking? Um, what is it? Is it the same as what we call hot coating? You and I call it hot coating. Um, are they the one and the same? And what's what is this? Uh, what is hot coating or hot flocking? 
Hot flocking, basically, you take your substrate that you're powder coating and you get it up to oven temperature of anywhere between 350 and 400 degrees, what is the temperature you're curing it at. Once that part is basically up to that temperature, you pull it out of the oven and you go straight into powder coating. And what happens is because the substrate is at that temperature, the powder immediately flows out over the substrate as it attaches. So it is great that that happens when you have hard to reach areas because it's sticking and flowing out immediately. The downside to that is you can put too much on very easily and you'll get drips and runs. Okay. So, um, and so is this why it's so controversial and why do you think industry sources warn against doing this or they don't even address it? I, I'm not even sure if it's in uh, manuals or technical stuff at all. Is it? Have you seen, ever uh, seen it? It is. It is. There, it is addressed. Uh, they do kind of frown upon it. Uh, I believe that the industry uh, basically says you, if your gun settings are proper, you don't need to do this. Uh, method and basically you're not doing it right. Uh, like I said earlier, some parts cannot be coated in the normal fashion. They just they're too recessed, and you can't get the powder in there. It's very difficult to do. All right, that sounds simple enough. Um, so when let's talk about you and your technique. When do you use this technique? And what specific parts uh, do you use it for? Or, you know, you know what I'm talking about. What kind of jobs does this I, work best for? Yeah, yeah. Now, hot flocking, I only really do it when I have hard to reach areas on parts. And I can pretty much name them on one hand. It's basically rims, specifically the lug holes. I have a very hard time doing that when they're just normal temperature. So I hot flock the rims always to get the powder into the rim holes. Another uh, situation I have is uh, like custom built uh, fenders. Those things are extremely difficult. Uh, they basically weld the compartments almost closed and they have like a little hole that you have to fit your gun into. And it's it's very hard to do that just at room temperature because the powder just doesn't stick in the corners uh, because of the way it's, it spins around in there. So I always hot flock that. Um, there's also lift kits. They have the same type of design like these custom uh, bumpers have. So pretty much those type of three things I, I always hot flock. Um, however, I don't hot flock the whole part. I just do the trouble problematic areas. And uh, that is my tip that I want to go over. Okay. Well, before we get into that, let's talk about, um, well, I'm going to talk about a very bad example or an example that happened actually just a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's always when you're doing things for a friend um, that sometimes bad things happen, right? So, um, you, uh, had picked up some fishing pole holders. Uh, if anybody knows what those are, um, if you fish, uh, especially here out in the ocean, um, people mount or have these, uh, fishing poles holders made out of metal, uh, usually around aluminum, right? Or stainless steel. And they'll, they'll mount them to the boat on the top part and the, you basically set and lock your fishing pole in there. So you can, um, uh, you can uh, drag your line and do the, um, deeper kind of fishing, I guess. I can't think of the name of it right now, but basically you're just popping the fishing pole in there and you're dragging your boat or dragging the line behind the boat. And, um, so you pick these things up there. They were a very small job and it was just supposed to be real simple. Uh, but something happened when you were hot coating them. 
Can you <laughs> tell us what happened? Well, actually, I, I wasn't um, planning. They were brand new fabrication, and I had uh, just put the primer coat on, and I had flashed it off, and I was actually uh, going to pull them out of the oven and let them cool down. And uh, what happened is the phone rang, and <laughs> I got on the phone, and I was talking, and blah, 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 blah. A few minutes go by, and then I got off the phone. I'm like, oh, yeah, I have to still have to do these. And I pull them out of the oven. And I usually let things cool down. I don't always hot flock. It, and specifically on these, they, they didn't really need to be hot flock. Uh, and what ha happened is exactly what happens when you hot flock, uh, you, you, I just started doing like my normal procedure and started coating it like two times like I normally do. And even though in a normal situation that's okay, when you hot flock, it is too much powder. And I, you know, I put them back in the oven and I brought them out after they were done curing and I had all the uh, just drips everywhere. I was just like, oh, God, you know. Uh, I, you know, and I knew better. And, uh, you know, one of my, my tricks that I do is I let, when I pull a part out and I want to coat it, now this is what I call hot coating. I basically let the part cool down before I put the powder on and I let it get to about 150 to 180 degrees. And then I apply the coating as normal, uh, and never have problems with it when I do it that way. But I didn't do that. I went straight to hot flocking and basically put too much powder on and it, it just ran like crazy. And it's really easy to do. You think you, you didn't, you thought you basically put the right amount on. Okay. It's not going to, it's not going to run. That was the perfect amount of passes. And then you put it in the oven and it's boom. You're just like, Oh my God, I barely put any on and it's running, you know? So it, it's really easy to make that mistake. Uh, and I think it's just because it flows out and it's deceptive on how much you're really putting on. So anyways, that was my uh, problem. And I had to sand all that all out and uh, redo it. Yeah. Uh, this particular piece, too, these pieces were angular um, because they had to be mounted at a certain angle in order for the uh, pole to rest easily in the socket. And um, I think angles... I think when I've seen you make mistakes like that it, and or you have drips, which is really actually kind of rare uh, these days, but um, it's the angle sometimes because it's hard to you're either putting it too heavy on one side and not enough on the other. I don't know. It's just it, it, that also can be problematic, but I'm not the powder coater. You are uh, just hear about it later when you're screaming and cursing and all of that fun stuff. So, um, but but before we finish out uh, your magic zone uh, tip, uh, let's talk about more about the troubleshooting um, about hot, hot coating because there's, you know, there's issues, there's things you got to do with your gun settings maybe, or is there a, is it grounding? I, I think you should talk about some of these other preface these other kind of things you have to have just right in order to get that magic zone and get your focus on? Well, right. Uh, obviously, the gun settings are very important. Uh, we want to have uh, the high voltage setting. Uh, now, Kim, you're not going to know much about this, but the listeners out there, they'll know. You'll want your high voltage setting at about 60, uh, your current limitation at 40, and uh, your powder feed quantity, you probably, you, what I, this is key actually, is you wanna really bring it down. And that's about 27% to 35%, somewhere in there. Um, if you don't have these type of functions on your gun, the main thing I wanna describe here is the powder cloud that's coming out of your gun. It needs to be really small. Um, comes out about four inches past the gun nozzle. Uh, you want it to be about a two inch, no more than three inch diameter cloud. And if you keep a real light, small cloud, it's easy to control the powder as it's going on into deep recessed areas. You can sit there, like for example, on lug holes, I will dial that just into those settings that I just said and I'll come right, I'll pull the trigger of the gun 
away from the rim. So I make sure my, my cloud is right. And then I come into the lug hole areas and in a circular pattern, I just kind of work it in there. Just a couple passes on each hole and it flows out. And then I step away, let the rim cool. I let the rim cool down to 150, 180 degrees. And then I turn my settings back up and I leave it still at the high voltage setting at 60 and the current limitation at 40, but I bring the powder feed quality up to about 50. And uh, then I get a bigger cloud and I just basically powder coat the whole rim as I normally would, two passes. And I start from the uh, back of the rim uh, where the center bore is and then work to the, uh, the inner lip and then I go to the front of the rim where the center cap would go and work that area and then work the outer lip there and then to the basically hub which is the outside where the tire goes and uh, I finish it up that's pretty much how I do a rim and I always stay with it like that every time and uh, from there we put the rim in the oven and it depends on what we're doing. If that's the first coat, which is like uh, a primer coat, which is probably the most important coat, believe it or not, because uh, you got to get that wheel protected. We'll just put that in the oven and uh, let it flash off and then continue to the next steps. And I repeat the same process on every coat. So it's almost like a Zen zone. I mean, uh <laughs> It's it's we called it a magic zone, but I actually kind of want to actually say that it's more like getting into your Zen mode or your focus, because um, this technique is the way it is. And you can easily you're sort of on a razor's edge. Sometimes you can easily make it uh, a, you can easily turn this into a boo boo on in any number of distraction or setting issue or grounding issue or whatever but when you have it right it's sort of like you're in the zens uh with uh you're really super focused on what you're doing and you're not having to redo the piece over and over again so it's or more like a do you think patience has a lot to do with it or is patience it just experience? Has everything, everything to do with it you have to uh, uh slow your roll you know, it, powder coating is a quick process. And uh, basically, when, when I first started doing the, the hot flocking, I, I did have lots of mistakes because I was just trying to do it all at once. And and when I realized, hey, you know, let's just, you know, and then I was always doing it with a high, huge powder cloud. So it was just too much powder getting on there. So uh, once I, you know, it's kind of a common sense thing. Hey, let's bring this down. And okay, that's nice. That's working good. Okay. And uh, well, hey, let's just uh, now I got all these problematic areas covered and they're all flowed out. Let's just set the rim out over here on the side here and uh, let it cool. And that's what I really, I can't stress it really helps because you're letting that room cool down to, uh, you know, uh, 150, 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Like I said, just take your infrared thermometer and go to the center bore in the back and when it gets to that temperature basically just start coating again and coat like you normally coat and it's warm it will stick very easily but it's not flowing out on you and it's not going to give you any problems but you've already got your problematic areas out of the way and you're not going to have any problems it's going to look great so uh, that's kind of my tip and I, I really it works for me and I, I hope it. Uh, if these guys out there that are having a hard time uh, hot flocking, I hope you try it out, and uh, it works really good. Uh, there's a lot of guys I see, like on YouTube, they actually uh, hot flock the whole rim, and they just bring their powder cloud down and just go over it real slow, and they know that they can only put so much on, and you know it, it's a gamble, and you know you just basically put it in the oven and go. But if you've done it a lot. Uh, you, you can do it that way all the time, but uh, I don't do rims every day. You know, I do uh, lots of stuff and, you know, railings, gates, I, you know, 
you name it, yeah. I've done it. And uh, so when I get a set of rims, it's like I have to slow down. I have to slow down what I'm doing because, you know, everybody that wants a rim wants it perfect. And and hot flocking actually is a little secret that I do to get it all in the, the corners and the crevices because if you don't do it, it, it's so easy to have it too thin. And then if you, you know, and then if you do hot flock and you do it, the whole rim hot flock, it's really easy to get a mistake and then you're redoing the whole thing. So, you know, I just think it's real important to stress, you know, get your powder cloud down, you know, let it flow out in the problematic areas. And then from there, set the rim down on the side, let it cool down or whatever kind of piece you're doing. And and then continue your, your, your coating as you normally would proceed. And um, of course, bring your powder cloud back up when you're doing that. And, uh, uh, it goes real smooth, and you always have a consistent, perfect coating, and that's what I like. Okay, well, let's talk for a minute about um, how you're hanging the rims, because I've seen you, especially with some of the problematic older rims that are pitted, uh, where you have to build up the surface uh, with primers and stuff like that, and I you and I talked about an example uh, prior to the podcast that, um, you know, it, like when you've got really bad chrome rims that you're trying to restore. Uh, can you can you give that example? Because I think that's another uh, sort of deeper layer into this hot flocking, um, especially since so many powder coaters do a lot of rims. Well, yeah, if you get a rim that's um, like chrome and it's, it's totally uh, been electrolyzed underneath the chrome and you blast that away and then you have all these just pitted. It's like a hammer tone finish almost. It's just totally dense and pits from where there used to be aluminum basically from being eaten away and you blast that away and now you're going to like, how do I make this look smooth again? And one of, this is a good hot flocking uh, exercise here. So, uh, and I normally do rims. I hang them uh, through the valve stem, and but in this situation, I hang them through the lug nut holes. And I do this with uh, uh, a bunch of C hooks, uh, six inch uh, quarter diameter C hooks. I use three of them, and I basically look like a, a, a almost like a Y, uh, you know, one through one hole, and then the other two holes. And I uh, use the one sixteenth, excuse me, a sixteen gauge wire. And then I go to one uh, major C hook to hang it on. And basically you hang it in that, instead of a, a vertical position, it's in a horizontal position. So when the rim's hot and you bring it out of the oven and you got lots of like just massive indentations from, from where the corrosion was, it's really easy in this position to put it on, hot flock it, and build it up, especially with a primer. Um, you can get that all built up, and it won't run and drip because of the way it's being held. And I only do this in the, the area that is bad. I hot flock that only the area that's bad, and it's because it's like a bowl. And because it's like a bowl, there's nowhere else for the powder to go, and it just builds up. And then you can basically get all those dimps and dibbles um, smoothed out uh, with just a basic light sanding. And then go to your uh, your color coat from there. Okay. Um, also, now talk just a minute for uh, how you normally like. If you just have a regular set of rims that are in pretty good shape, uh, you 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 have a, a unique way to get good grounding. I, I would wonder if you could share that with the audience, um, just in case those that are kind of new to this uh, could use this really helpful tip. Right. Okay. So uh, I use uh, five sixteenths, basically regular, a nut that's about uh, three quarters of an inch long. Uh, excuse me, bolt. And then I have the five sixteenth nut. It's a just basic nut, no lock wash or anything like that, or locking nut. It's just a regular nut. And I basically put that through the valve stem. That will fit through 90% of the valve stems and it fits nice so it's it's tight and there's no slop and uh, what I really like about this method is when you take the wire and come around the back side of the valve stem where the hub is and 
I put my wire around it and then I basically tighten the bolt, the nut down onto the bolt and it snitches that wire right up to the rim. And it's going to be like that throughout the whole coating process. And so you'll always have a great ground. I mean, it's just, it is on there. And I have found that, you know, you, by doing it that way, you're, you're basically taking grounding problems totally out of the loop. And of course, I also do some other tricks in my shop as far as grounding. Um, we have a metal building, so I ground to the main stud of the building that goes into the ground. And then I go from there to my gun, and from there it goes to the booth and also the part. So I do a Y there, so I'm directly connected to the part. I actually connect it right to the seat hook at the very top. And I never have a grounding issue ever. And that seems to really work well. Well, that sounds like a great tip. Um, of course, I don't powder coat, but I do hear you all the time. And, and you have crafted this um, advice and methodology over the course of your powder coating career. And uh, n not only that, but with the satisfied customers that we have. Um, and you're also a super perfectionist too, uh, almost to a fault sometimes, because a lot of times I'm like, it's good enough. Just get it out. Right. You know, because, and this will be something that is going to be coming up in an, an upcoming episode uh, with a special guest that I'm invited over to talk about pricing, costing uh, issues, you know, and one of the topics I want to say is how good is good enough. And, you know, can it, sometimes you and I get into a tussle about the price that we're charging versus uh, what, um, what level of perfection, you know, uh, they're going to get. So that's for another episode, but I think it's an important one to cover uh, and it'll be coming up in the next couple weeks. We also just want to preface this by saying that, you know, this is how we do it. We are not learned school. You might have learned something different from someone else and we're all here to learn and um, and learn from each other too as well. So that's the reason for the podcast and for getting this information out to you guys. Um, you should always, always um, reference or read up your powder coating manuals, your tech manuals, your equipment manuals, and pay attention to how you learn because um, it is a methodology um, we're just here to not spill the secrets or share too much or whatever. It's just that we feel like, you know, people need to know more and there's just too much disinformation out there that we're trying to, uh, maybe clear the air, cl clear the powder coat, uh, the powder coating cloud that comes out of <laughs> the gun, some, so to speak. Um, one last thing, you know, and I don't know if we want to just because we've talked about a lot of things here and I don't want to have people spinning and questioning, but they can always go over the podcast again if they want to hear it. But um, you talk about this sweet spot or the passes. Uh, you talked about that earlier, especially with rims and the degrees or sort of the temperature. Could you just like maybe, you know, go over that one more time um, just as a final wrap up to this podcast um, about your way and why you do three passes, maybe. Um, yeah, uh, share. yeah, sure. What I do is, like I said earlier, after I'm done with the hot locking, I basically let the piece cool down. Uh, the reason I do that is because I don't want to have any drips or runs. And if I let it cool down to 150, 180 degrees, it not only adheres properly, uh, with normal um, settings, it basically allows you to lay it up. And I do two runs, just two passes. And, you know, I don't go real slow, but I don't go real fast. It's just, a, you know, everybody has their own speed. And I work in circular motions generally with the rims. Uh, so that's what I like to do. 
it works for me and I never have problems. And I always, people always comment, man, how do you get this so perfect and glossy? And I go, it's just two quick passes. And the key is I do it at 150 to 180 degrees because the powder is sticking to the rim. It's not, you know, flooding around in the air. It is attaching to the rim. And, and, and that's what's really neat about the hot coating aspect of it, that sweet zone of 150 to 180 degrees. Uh, it, it, it makes it super simple. I do that on gates and railings, too, uh, when we're doing big runs, because if it's a little, if the part's warm like that, it just makes it easy, and you can just fly through it real quick, and you know everything's attaching, and you're done. You just put that sucker back in the oven and let it go. Uh, I had one more thing to say about the rims um, and how to hang them. Uh, there's another way, too, also uh, – with like German rims, specifically BMW, Audi, everybody knows what I'm talking about. Those uh, valve stem holes are really deep on those, and it's hard to find something to go through there and hold it. And what I have used is a 3 sixteenths washer, and the 3 sixteenths diameter hole is perfect for running a 16th gauge wire through, and basically you put that through the valve stem hole there and the washer will hold it no problem and you don't get like these lines and marks in the the, the well of the uh, valve stem hole and you get a nice perfect uh, ground because it's nice and it's pulled up tight now granted it's not as good as the uh, the, the washer and nut method but I mean I can't find a good washer and nut to fit in there uh, for the life of me. So that's what I've been using is a 3 16 washer on those German-style rims. And uh, don't forget to put those in the B-17 for the half a day. <laughs> yeah. <enough> that one. <laughs> well, that's been awesome, Ross. And I thank you for joining me again today from the dining room table. I uh, appreciate it. Um, and uh, we also like to thank our support, uh, supportive followers and fellow powder coders out, out there. I hope you've learned something new about powder coating in your business. Please comment below, follow, share the podcast. Uh, if you have a topic you'd like to discuss, just email us at info at MauiPowderWorks.com or message us on Facebook. Until then, we'll see you soon.